Chris Godinas, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday at noon. This video is for educational and informational purposes only. If you feel you need a therapist, please go to Google, type in therapy, your city, psychology today will pop up, click on that, and it will have qualified therapists in your area. Also, the views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other damn therapist for that matter. Boom, shakalaka done. Okay, so this series of questions is going to be on divorce. D-I-V-O-R-C-E. So we're going to talk about divorce. Okay. So, um, cause there's been a bunch of questions on that. So first of all, cause what's happening is with the, the quarantine and, and working from home and all of this, people are beginning to realize, oh my gosh, I'm in an abusive relationship. I need to get out. Oh my gosh, there's kids involved. What am I doing? How do I do this? Oh my gosh. You know, so there's a lot of stuff happening. So first of all, and first and foremost, buy this book. It's called Splitting. It is by Bill Eddy and Randy Krieger. Randy Krieger is the one that wrote uh, Stop Walking on Eggshells. One of the ones that wrote Stop Walking on Eggshells. Splitting is an excellent book. Get it. It's going to basically let you know, you know, to protect yourself while divorcing someone with borderline or narcissistic personality disorder. They talk about all the things that I've been talking about forever and a day about what they do when you actually go to divorce. So splitting, Bill Eddy, Randy Krieger, get it. You're going to need it. Absolutely read it and believe it. So one of the big things I see is that people, I'm going to get my hair out of my face. It's just, la, 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 la. There we go. Um, one of the big things I see is that people don't believe that their spouse is going to behave as heinously as they're going to in the middle of a divorce. And, and the reason is, is because we've got abuse amnesia, right? We don't, we don't think that the abuse was bad. We minimize, oh, it's not that bad. Oh, it could be worse. So, you know, all of that stuff. We minimize, we do all of this and we think, oh, well, it's, you know, we've got kids. Of course, they're going to be, you know, fair and, and split the custody and this, that, and the other thing. Listen to me now. Believe me later. They are going to try to screw you over every single way possible and they will use the children as pawns. This is, this is their nature. You remember the, the, the story of the scorpion and the toad and the scorpion comes up to the toad and says, Mr. Toad, take me for a ride across the river. And this toad looks at him and says, no, Mr. Scorpion, you're going to sting me. And then the scorpion goes, no, no, I wouldn't do that. Mr. Toad, that would be stupid. We get out in the middle of the river, I'd sting you, we'd both die. Why would I do that? And toad thinks about it. And so he goes, okay, hop on. And so the scorpion hops on and they get out into the river and he's swimming along and they get about to the middle of the river and I'll be damned if the scorpion didn't sting the toad. And as they're drowning, as they're going down, the toad looks at the scorpion and goes, but Mr. Scorpion, why? Why? Why would you do this? Now we're both going to die. And the scorpion looks at him and goes, it's in my nature. That's what narcissists do. That is what malignant narcissists, malignant borderlines do. They would rather blow themselves up and take you down with them than to behave like a decent human being. So I just want you to keep that in mind. And it doesn't mean don't divorce. It means by all means divorce, but just know that it's not, they're not ever going to behave like you do. Our biggest mistake is, is that we assume that they are going to be decent people because we're decent people. They're not decent people. Trust me on that one. Okay, so something else you need to know, uh, and I've had multiple cases of this. They will drag you back into court every single year if they can. That's why it's really important to get a goddamn good attorney. And what abusers do is they set it up so that the spouse doesn't have enough money to get an attorney or doesn't have access to funds or, you know, whatever. And so, but they'll go hire a hotshot attorney and they'll keep the, the uh, custody battle, the divorce case. They'll take it going for as long as they possibly can. I had one case, this was years ago, where the divorce happened over 12 years ago. Every year, got drugged back into the court. Every single year, every single time there was any sort of parenting issue or the crazy ex didn't like something that was happening would drag the spouse back into court. And thank God the spouse actually had a good job so that person could afford it. But their goal is to use the courts as abuse by proxy. And this is why we need to educate family court judges on how this happens. Some of them get it. Some of them don't. Some of them are narcissists themselves. So, you know, this is something that really needs to be brought to the public eye and really needs to be educated about in uh, uh, 
when you're going through law school. You know, if, if you're going to go on and be a judge or you're going to go on and do family law, you need to understand that a lot of times, that a lot of times, most of the time, the courts are being used as abuse by proxy to punish the spouse that got away. So there is that. They will drag you back into court. So the average uh, retention fee to retain an attorney is around uh, anywhere from 2000 on up. You know, I've heard of some attorneys demanding a ridiculous amount of money, like $25,000. And I'm like, on what fucking planet does anybody have that kind of money? Thanks for playing, especially if you're in an abusive relationship. So uh, you're going to want to have good legal counsel. So here in Phoenix, we've got a place called Fresh Start Women's Resource Center, and they do have attorneys that will, they have a legal clinic. They won't represent you. They can't represent you in court, but they can help you fill out the paperwork, and that cuts down on the cost. So there is that. Um, all right, what are some of the behaviors that they'll do? All right, so some of the really heinous things that I have seen is that once the custody gets going, okay, um, they'll do games with the kids. And I don't mean fun games either. I mean, like, they'll, you'll send the kid over with brand new shoes, brand new jacket, brand new toys, brand new iPad, whatever. And mysteriously, all of that disappears and they come back wearing clothes that are two years too small for them or no shoes. I have seen abusers send the kid back with no shoes in the dead of winter or in the heat of summer because they are, say it with me, they're a fucking asshole. So they use their kids as pawns and they'll use their kids in any way they can to poke at you. That's what they're doing. They want you to react. So that brings us to another thing. Do not react. So you're in a divorce. You're in a contentious divorce, a high conflict divorce with an abuser, or you're in a high custody issue set up with an abuser. Do not respond to anything that does not directly have to do with the kids. Their whole goal is to poke the bear, poke the bear, poke the bear, poke the bear. And then when you growl back, oh, you're abusing me. That's their whole bullshit. Okay. It's the reactive abuse, right? So you growl back and suddenly you're the bad guy. You don't want that. What you want to do is you want to make sure to get one of those apps. There's a parental thing where all emails are recorded and it goes through a different system and it's, you know, nobody can mess with it. And, you know, there's, there's something to think of there. But, yeah, they will steal clothes. They will steal toys. They'll destroy phones. I've seen them do that. You know, you can't talk to your father. You can't talk to your mother on my time. Um, sorry, if the kid needs to call the mom or the dad, they should be able to call the mom or the dad. And that needs to be written into the decree. Seriously. You're going to have to write shit into the decree that no normal person would have to write into a decree because the narcissist is very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? If it's not written in there, he doesn't, he or she does not have to abide by it in their mind. They're crazy. So what you want to do is you want to make sure to put everything in writing in the decree. So when they violate it, you can be like, your honor, they, they destroyed the iPad. They wouldn't let them talk to me. They wouldn't let, you know, whatever. So yeah, be prepared. It is not going to be pretty. It is not going to be pretty because unless, caveat, if the narcissist, if the abuser is the one to divorce you, if they found a new supply and they're off in la la land with their new, their new supply, hopefully, hopefully they'll be eager to be rid of you and you can just push it through and get stuff done. I've seen that happen too. So they do one of two things. They either you know, if it's not their idea, they come unglued and they want to fight it, fight it, fight it, fight it. Because remember, they would rather have a fucked up, dysfunctional connection to somebody than no connection at all. If it is their idea, you know, and they've got a new supply and they want to move on with the new supply, then they may just let it go and you'll be able to get the divorce done and be done with them. So next question, do I make my ex have contact with the kids? They have completely and totally ghosted and abandoned us. What do I do? If they have ghosted and abandoned you, you keep it that way. You just don't reach out. You know, it's like, it's up to them. They're an adult. They can contact if they want. And if they haven't, and if you've got proof that you've reached out a couple of times and they're just not contacting the kids and they're not interested in having anything to do with them, that's more for your favor so that you can go back and either ask for more child support or you can um, look at possibly, you know, making it so the kids are not 
forced to go over there if they are forced to go over there and usually if they have no contact at all there's no there's no going over there because they're always busy so that's something to take into consideration I had another case where the client was constantly being asked to take the kids on the opposite parents time because the opposite parent was out partying and doing drugs and drinking and this that and the other thing and so my client started you know writing it all down and keeping track and you know eventually hired a private detective caught them drinking got a DUI on them you know I mean it, these are the links that you sometimes have to go to to make sure that your kids are safe and it's time consuming it's it's emotionally draining and it's a financial burden but that is their intent that's the other thing you want to start doing is if you end up going for uh, support child support um, remember they're they don't understand narcissists don't get that the money is not going to you it's not like you're gonna get the money and you're gonna go you know party you know but that's in their head because that's what they would do remember they project so when they're having to pay child support what they'll do is they'll piss and whine and moan, I don't want you to have it, blah, 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 blah. They'll try to get out of it, um, or they just won't pay it at all. But in the state of Arizona, I believe, and I don't know for sure, but double check, I believe you can ask for child support, arreared, you know, back child support after the child has turned 18. So you want to check with your attorney. It's like, well, what are my options? This asshole or this assholeette is not paying money on child support. What do I do? So find out what your options are. And sometimes um, it works out that, you know, okay, they haven't paid, the kid is now 18, well, now they don't have a lever. There's nothing they can use. They can't, you know, get into that kid's head and start using the kid as a pawn and this, that, and the other thing. You just have everything go through, you know, the, the Department of Economic Security or legal services or whatever. So check with your attorney. Um, yeah, and but they think that somehow that this money is going to you as opposed to, you know, feeding your child, feeding their child, clothing, uh, you know, <laughs> expenses, medical, hello, you know, so they're very, very selfish. Okay, um, I'm so upset. I feel like they have moved on, but here I am stuck. They look so happy when I look at their profiles on Facebook. Okay, when you divorce an abuser the first thing you're gonna to want to do unless there's kids involved you're gonna to want to block them on everything meaning no social media no email you know etc if there's kids involved obviously you're gonna to want to have a way to see what's going on right so um, but if there are no children involved stop stalking their Facebook pages or their snapchat or their Instagram or whatever Y'all don't need to know unless there's kids involved. And in some cases, stalking the ex has actually been a good thing because obviously there were issues with the children and then you could prove that because you could take screenshots and blah, 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 blah. But if there are no children involved, stop looking at their Facebook page. Remember, narcissists are all about image, right? So it could be rotten to the core, but they'll be presenting this pretty, 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 you know, outlook about how this new supply is just so wonderful and so much better and blah, 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 blah. And they're doing it on purpose because they want you to read it. They want you to be, you know, oh my goodness, oh, I've lost out. You know, no, no. They're putting up a fake persona of who they are and what they're about. You know what, who they are and what they're about. You don't need to be stalking their Facebooks or Instagrams or Snapchats or whatever, unless, like I said, there's kids involved and you want to get proof of what's going on. So, um, yeah. So it's no longer about them, guys. It's no longer about them. Remember, they are going to move from supply to supply to supply to supply to supply to supply. That's what they do. And they do want to punish you by, oh, look, look how beautiful my life is. Oh, look, look how, how perfect everything, look how happy we are, blah, 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 blah. You know, meanwhile, you don't know what's going on behind closed doors. Probably the same thing that was going on behind your guys' closed doors. So you really got to get out of that needing to, um, to spy on them, like I said, unless, caveat, there are children involved going back and forth, and this is kind of a way to keep an eye on, you know, what's going on. Uh, an example of that would be uh, if the uh, opposing parent is, you know, again, drugging and drinking and there's all sorts of pictures of them partying on the times when they're supposed to be having the kids. Yeah, you could use that. So, um, okay. Uh, 
Okay. And so, so this time period, it's really important for you to work on you. It's not about them. It's not about them. It's not. They could be doing whatever and it's not about them. You need to work on you. You need to work on your self-esteem. You need to work on trusting your gut, not your head, not your heart. Trust your gut. You need to be working on boundaries. You need to be working on your list of deal breakers. What will you not put up with from anybody so that you don't get involved in another abusive relationship? So it's not about them anymore. It's not. It's about you. Work on your self-esteem. Get the self-esteem workbook by Glenn Schiraldi. Get the disease to please by Harriet Breaker. Um, journal. Write. Write and burn. Get it out of your head. Get it onto paper. Start working CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. Um, do the Inner Child Workbook by Katherine Taylor. You know, there's a ton of really good books out there. And anytime that little thought pops up about, oh, I just want to think about them and blah, 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 blah. So remember, we get addicted to them. We get addicted to them because of the intermittent positive rewards. You know, I love you, I love you, I love you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I love you, I hate you, I love you, I hate you, I love you, I hate you. And we start living for those days when it's the love bombing. So when your brain is looking for that endorphin, dopamine, whatever, you've got to do thought stopping. Thank you, thought. I hear you. I see you. I am not going to resist you because if I'm resisting you, I'm like, ah, I'm not thinking about it, I'm not thinking about it, I'm not thinking about it. What am I thinking about the whole time? And I'm also not going to invite you in. I'm not going to invite you into coffee. So, because you'll stay for dinner. So you want to go, uh-huh, yep, my brain really wants a hit of endorphins, dopamine, serotonins, and um, you know what? That's not going to work. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Go play in traffic. You know, journal it out. Journal it out. Remind yourself of the rotten things that they did to you. And on that topic, the other thing, and another question is a little further down, but I'm going to kind of combine it into this one. The other thing that we tend to do is we hang on to the anger. And we hang on to the anger and the resentment because we think that somehow we're punishing them with that. Let me make this perfectly clear. There's no there there. They don't care. They don't. Your pain, your suffering, they don't care. They don't care. They really truly do not give two rats asses about how you're feeling, obviously, or they wouldn't have been abusers in the first place. So um, anger and resentment is like picking up two hot coals intending to throw it at somebody else. You're the only one getting burned. And here's another thing. If we are hanging on to the anger, it's a way to keep the relationship alive. I know. I realized that with my dad. I was so hugely angry at my dad. I was always angry at my dad, always angry at my dad, always angry at my dad. And then working with my therapist, I realized, oh, well, he's dead, but this is how I keep him alive. This is how I try to fix that relationship, the codependency. This is how I try to make him better even though he's dead. So it's a way to keep that relationship going even though it's dead. So you want to let that go. You want to work on grieving the loss of that relationship because all of that stuff about, well, if I'm angry and I can just yell at him and da 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 da, it's not going to bring him back. It's not going to make the relationship healthy. It's not going to change anything. Now, anger is healthy and normal as long as you express it, you write it out, journal it out, punch it out, do whatever you need to, and then you let it go. Where it becomes dangerous is where we go, I'm angry, and I'm going to stay angry, and I'm going to keep being angry, and fuck that asshole, and, rah, 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 and we just stay there. That's, that's not a natural state of being. So what you want to do is you want to be able to express your anger, not to them. Remember, they don't care. There's no there there. They're a normal, healthy person would care. A normal, healthy person, first of all, would not act like a fucking narcissist or malignant narcissist, malignant borderline. But, you know, a healthy, normal person would want to know, okay, what are you angry about? How did I hurt you? They don't care. These assholes don't care. So what you're going to do is you're going to write and burn. Dear whoever, dear spouse, dear parent, dear boss, dear friend, dear coworker, dear whatever, fuck the fuckity fuck fuck out of fucking fuck you. In the beginning, it was the good, and then it went to the bad, and then the ugly, and then the horrific. You don't get to live rent-free in my head one more goddamn second. Fuck you. Get out. Go to hell. Do whatever. I don't care. Just don't do it around me. And then trot it out to the barbecue. Read it out loud once. Let it go. Burn it. Let it go. All right, so there is that. So letting go of anger. Anger is a way to hang on to the memory of them, and it, it jacks up our endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, etc. So work on letting that stuff go. Um, okay. What do I do? They were constantly accusing me of cheating. 
I didn't cheat and come to find out they were the cheaters. So, okay, here's the deal. Courts don't care who did what. What they want to do is get the divorce settled and off their docket. That's all they care about, really. And, and I know it, it doesn't sound fair, but remember, the narcissist is going to use the court as a grand theater, and they're going to present all of their bullshit, or try to, and especially if they represent themselves. I don't know who said it. I think it was Shakespeare. I can't remember. Somebody somebody corrected me on this the other time, but it's like whoever represents himself in court has a fool for a client. So, you know, I mean, especially when they do it this way. And I'm not saying that, you know, when you don't have money and you have to represent yourself, that's a little different. Narcissists are so arrogant that they think they know the law and they think they know how to manipulate the courts. And I've seen it multiple times. So they'll represent themselves and they'll try to turn the court into this ginormous drama, you know, worthy of Jersey Shore kind of thing. You know, so um, that's when they'll bring up, you know, cheating and this, that, and the other thing. And let me tell you right now, the court doesn't care. The court does not care. What they want is, do you agree on splitting the estate? Do you agree on custody? You stick to facts and figures. Your ex is going to go for the emotional bullshit all the time. And I'll tell you what, the judge is going to get real sick and tired of it. Because their whole thing is, get in, agree, get out. That's what they want. So, and that's why narcissists inevitably, and borderlines too, drag out divorce cases. Because to them, it's exciting. To them, it's drama. To them, it's a distraction. So, yeah, they love that stuff. So, um, and if they're accusing you of cheating and you know you didn't cheat, they're talking about themselves. They project. They project. So every time I hear somebody making outrageous accusations and you know that that other person didn't do it, I'm just like, mm, talking about yourself again, huh? Seriously. So just realize that. Again, it's not about you. It's about them. You know, it's like this is their projection. They're projecting what they did. And especially in the leading up to the uh, devalue and discard, they'll, they'll ramp up the, you know, accusations. You're cheating. You're this. You're that. You're, you know, you, 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 you guns. And then it turns out they were the ones cheating. They were the ones that had the mistress or the mister on the side, you know. So, yeah. So it's projection. Absolutely. Um... Self-esteem is important. Work on the self-esteem with Self-Esteem Workbook by Glenn Schiraldi. Uh, we talked about hanging on to anger. Don't do it. Ask for legal fees. So if you are being drugged back to court year after year, and if they start pulling crap, ask for legal fees. Seriously, because really the only thing they understand is being hit in the pocketbook. And, and if you can get legal fees, great. The worst that can happen is they say no. But do ask, try to ask for legal fees. If, if they're cont continually bringing you back into court and trying to create, you know, legal issues that are frivolous, ask for legal, legal fees. Talk to your lawyer about that. Um, work on self-esteem. Said that again. Abandoning and ghosting. I talked a little bit about that earlier. If they have abandoned and ghosted the kids and they're not responding to emails, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, do not force them to be in a relationship. So, for example... I've had several clients that, you know, ended up forcing the ex to have a relationship with the kid. And then they went on a campaign of parental alienation and made sure that the relationship between the other parent was just completely destroyed. You don't want, if they've ghosted, let sleeping dogs lie. Seriously. It's like you make a couple of attempts to, you know, hey, this, that, and the other thing. And then you show that they've pretty much abandoned. They've given up their time. They're not watching the kids on their time. You're always watching them, whatever. And then you go for full custody. Absolutely. And then people are like, oh, but, you know, kids need the other parent. Well, if they're healthy, if they're normal, if they're sane, yeah, they need the other parent. But these people are not healthy. They are not normal. And they are not sane. And they will undermine your parenting. You will be co-parenting, not co-parenting, parallel parenting for the rest of your life until they turn 18. And then even after that, you're going to be having to struggle with weddings and babies and all sorts of stuff. So um, they'll never behave like a normal person. Stop expecting them to. Stop expecting them to. It's not going to happen. Um, okay. Um, you, and no, the kid does not need a narcissist in their life. They don't need a malignant borderline in their life. They don't. If they've abandoned them and they're out, you know what? Teach them self-esteem. 
teach them boundaries, teach them deal breakers. They don't need that particular person in their life. And hopefully someone will be a good role model for them, you, <laughs> of how to do both roles, mom and dad, you know. So there that is. Uh, journaling is huge. You want to document everything. You want to keep everything to emails or texts. You need everything in writing because these fuckers will lie and believe about what they've lied and you're going to have to prove to the court, no, we agreed on this, 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 and this. The other thing you're going to want to do is uh, do not respond to anything that is not pertinent to the case. So, for example, what I've seen crazy malignant narcissists do is they'll send 14 page letters, you know, with all of this personal, you know, damnation in there and one tiny line about the kids or one tiny line about the actual divorce issue or whatever. You do not respond to the other 14 pages. You respond to the one tiny line that is regarding the kids or the divorce. Other than that, you do not respond and that's going to piss them off. Good. So, and, and it's really kind of what you want. So, because then when they get into court and they start trying to do their grand theatrics, the judge is going to look at them and be like, what the actual fuck? No, I'm not ruling in your favor. So, uh, write journal burn. Um, burn it if it's something you need to let go of. Journal and keep it if it is something you need to keep for evidence. Keep all of the texts. Keep all of the emails. Only respond to things that are about the divorce or about the kids. You do not respond to any of the other emotional stuff. If you have to have contact with them, so you're doing a handoff, right? This is another question. If you have to have contact with them, gray rock, gray rock, gray rock, gray rock, gray rock, you do not give them anything. Absolutely nothing. And they're going to try. They're going to try to poke. They're going to try to get you to, you know, respond. They're going to provoke. They're going to do whatever. So you want to gray rock, and just if they call you, don't answer the phone. Make it go to voicemail, respond in email. So everything needs to be written down, okay? Everything needs to be written down. Listen to me now, believe me later. Okay, I hope this answers all those questions. So uh, this Sunday on uh, We Need to Talk, I'm going to be talking about the parental wound and how to heal that and the difference between a healthy substitution role model and an unhealthy codependent one. So I want to talk about, you know, how to navigate that healing, that wound kind of thing. All right, guys. Well, have a great day and I will talk to you on Sunday. Bye.